What's up, y'all? And welcome back to Dad Needs to Talk. I'm your host, Robert, and today we are taking a look at a classic called Less Misery Bliss. Now, this is a story that is probably a definition of great stories can withstand the test of time because this story um, was originally written by Victor Hugo back in 1862 and it has had a bevy of adaptations across film, TV series, animated series and of course this manga omnibus version that I am reading now 161 years later (laughs) and I am honestly at a loss for words with how much I enjoy this Um, now this was a this version is published by Seven Seas and like I said it's an omnibus so it's two volumes in one in this edition and to kind of start off before, before I continue my rambling, um, this starts off with a quote from Victor Hugo that says, so long as ignorance and misery remain on earth, books like this cannot be useless. So this is a tale that I feel like even just based off of this first omnibus, um, is something that is just very true and very relatable to anybody out there, anybody that has lived a life, um, because this story really highlights how close a lot of us are to reaching the highest of heights or the lowest of lows. Um, because that's kind of where this story kicks off with one of our main characters, um, John, this gentleman on the front cover. Um, he is basically kind of helping to raise his, um, I believe it's his sister-in-law, if I'm remembering correctly, um, because I believe his brother died. And so he's helping the sister-in-law raise the kids i think she had like seven kids and so you know he's he's working um he basically his his main job is he's a pruner of trees so you know kind of cutting out trees and making money that way but of course as the seasons change you know it becomes winter and stuff then you know the trees are withering so so that job isn't needed as much whatever but you got a family they need to eat And so he kind of ends up in a unfortunate situation that I definitely feel because as a parent myself and a family man, even being an uncle and stuff years before I was a dad, um, I have been in situations myself to where, you know, it's been a little bit of a rough patch financially or just whatever. And it's like, man. What can I do to try to earn some extra money or to try to maybe sell something I have, you know, here at the house or whatever to make a few bucks to, you know, get us something to eat or to get, you know, something that my kids might need for school or just whatever the case may be. And so that part was just so relatable that it hooked me. And throughout this book, this very meaty book. Um, this was a theme that continued to show up, like I said, both sides from people reaching the highest of highs, people reaching the lowest of lows and kind of seeing both the, the horrific and the beautiful side of humanity. And what I mean by that is that sometimes, you know, We don't know what situations people are going through and then you just talking down on a person or not even giving them a chance to try to explain what happened or what their situation is can just push a person further down. But sometimes there are people in the world that will lend a helping hand, not for any malicious intent or any ulterior motives, just because of the kindness of their heart. And 
that is something that was beautiful to see throughout me reading this. And so I'm going to kind of go through just a few highlights of um, some key moments that kind of happened throughout this story because it, it spans several years, um, which which I kind of like a story like that. that kind of uh, follows, like, follows some characters over the course of some years. So the first event that kind of happens that kind of uh, sets John on his spiral of 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 a uh, downfall was like I said, um, the seasons changed. It got cold. His family was starving, and so he's going to town like, hey, begging for money for anything, whatever to help. Nobody would give him the time of day, and so he's passing by this baker's shop, and he sees some bread in the window. He's like, man, that loaf of bread would last us, you know, at least will help us get by with him for a while, and so. He did what he felt he needed to do. He tried to steal the bread, but immediately got caught and then got sentenced to five years in prison for stealing bread. And so, of course, he's trying to plead with the police and with the judges. Like, hey, you know, my my family, there's kids, you know, da, 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 da. And they're like, hey, we don't care. You broke the law. You stole from an honest man, this baker, you know, five years of labor. And of course, during these years of him being in prison or whatever, you know, he's doing pretty good. But then he gets word of something happening with one of the kids or that or that somebody saw the sister-in-law with one of the kids. And then he's like, yo, but there's like seven kids. And the guy's like, I only saw one. I don't know. All I know is I only saw her with one kid. And so, of course, that makes him start to panic, and then he tries to break out, and he tries to break out multiple times. So now, him stealing this piece of bread to feed his family went from a five-year prison sentence to him doing 19 years altogether. Because, of course, when he got caught again, all the times he tried to escape, they added more years to his sentence, and then 19 years later, he comes out, he's like, hey, do you know what happened with the family, whatever, and all he what he hears of course we don't have any firm confirmation of this but people are just saying like man 19 years do you know how long that has been that is enough time for for a uh for a single woman for a single mother and her uh seven children to disappear into the darkness into the void basically and so he gets handed a sack of money for his time that he did in prison and just sent out into the world with some papers that say that he's a convicted felon so that anytime he goes to a new town you know as you're entering the town they're like hey where's your papers or whatever and when they see this i think it's something that says a yellow paper he's immediately known to be a convict and then of course that just continues the the uh downward spiral and just the tough time that he has now transitioning from there we end up meeting this bishop of a town who is the true definition of selfless. He is this high-ranking uh, religious figure, but unlike a lot of the other priests and bishops and stuff, whatever, he does not live an extravagant life. He lives like he lives very small, very uh, moderate in a nice little house with his sister, and I think they have like, like a maid or a helper or whatever, and he gives away all his wealth to the to the uh, to the to the town, to the people, all that stuff. He's a man of the people, and so Jean eventually ends up wandering his way to this man, and uh, ends up finding shelter there. He ends up getting fed and everything, but Jean ends up stealing from the man just because he he is so paranoid from the nineteen years of hardship that he dealt with. He can't believe that somebody would help him just out of pure kindness and so he ends up stealing from the man or whatever gets captured brought back to the to the bishop but and and keep in mind john didn't know that this guy was a bishop during this time or whatever because like i said the guy lived a very simple life he wasn't dressed in extravagant clothes or whatever and so when it's revealed like that this guy was a bishop or whatever the guy forgave john and just told the police oh no no i, I gave him this uh silver uh because uh, it was some literal silver, silverware dishes and stuff, whatever that he stole, and so this bishop man was like, "No, take it or whatever," 
and gave him even like his prize, like these like a uh, really uh, beautiful like candlesticks or candlestick holders or whatever. And so, yeah. And then um, the bishop basically just tells John that like, hey, the only thing I ask for from you is that you live an honest life. Um, and that is kind of what John sets out to try to do. And so transitioning from John's story, uh, we get a little bit of a uh, introduction to our next character, which is a uh, Fantine with this uh, beautiful image of her in the rain as a young lady because she was kind of stranded alone, didn't know anything, didn't know her name, and this stranger that passed by just was like, was like, okay, your name is gonna be uh, Fantine, and so. This was another case of, you know, we had had, had this young lady. She should grow up to be a beautiful young lady. Was living the high life. Uh, uh, with these nobles and stuff. And ended up kind of falling in love and was promised the world by things from, from this guy. And she ended up having this child and all this stuff. And... <laughs> Probably one of like the dirtiest things I have seen in a while is so so it's 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 all these young women and stuff with these guys, these older men, they you know have shown them the world for the last couple of years and stuff, whatever, and then they wine and dine them and then literally in the middle of the night they're like, Hey, we have a big surprise for y'all or whatever and they're all drunk and having a good time. And they're like, hey, just stay stay here at this place and wait for your surprise. Hours pass by deep into the middle of the night. And then the waiter brings them a letter. And it's addressed from the guys. It's like, hey, basically saying, hey, it's been fun. But we're all from noble families. And our, and our parents are expecting us to return home. And, you know... We can't have they they can't know about we have all these women and stuff everywhere. So goodbye to y'all. Hey, we pay for dinner, but you never see us again because by the time you're seeing this letter, we're all gonna be miles away from here. So goodbye. And so that kind of begins Fantine's journey through her hardship because now she is this single mother. In this world where, you know, she no longer has that support with this child. And so she's so she ends up uh, leaving the town, trying to head her way, trying to head back home. But she also knows that the struggle of being a single mom with a child is like not, not many places are going to hire you and your options for work are going, are going to be limited. And so something kind of scary happens in here in this moment it's like she is just passing by and she sees this two these two young girls about the same age as her daughter um just playing and having a good time and she ends up meeting their mom and so they're talking and stuff whatever and so fantine so the lady kind of makes like an offhand comment about like because the girl all three girls start playing together whatever and the lady makes a comment like man they're already hey they're already getting along like their sisters and so Fantine comes up with the idea. She's like, hey, can I leave my daughter with y'all while I go away and work? I can send money for her to help her or whatever until I can kind of get on my feet. And then once I saved up some money, I'll come back for my daughter. And so the husband of this of this lady is like, okay, <laughs> does she have clothes? Your daughter's wearing some fancy clothes. Is all her clothes like that? And Fantine's like, oh yeah, you know, I don't care so much about, you know, how I look or whatever, but hey, I want my daughter to have, basically, you know, be nice, dress nice and all this stuff, whatever. And so the guy is like, okay, well, hey, here's the deal. We'll raise her, but make sure you give her, give us, you know, a few sets of clothes. And this is how much you'll have to send each month for, for supposedly for food and stuff, whatever. But it all ends up being a, uh a ploy a racket um because of course fantine's like okay cool i'll agree to that or whatever thank you so much and she leaves her daughter in the middle of the night with these complete strangers that she just happened to meet in passing on her journey and 
that is like so scary to think about, especially like, you know, like back in these times before we have all the all the wonders of technology and communication that we have nowadays. It is like, you know, I could leave my kids, at, you know, <laughs> at, at my in-laws houses or whatever. But I know, OK, hey, if I need to check up on my kids, I can text them. I can call them. Heck, I can even you know video call them to actually see them and stuff, whatever. And it's like, no, back in this time, it's like you leave your kids somewhere and it's like, yeah, you might be getting letters in the mail or whatever. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Rob, your son, Vash, she's doing fine, doing awesome. And then it's like, boy, them being kidnapped or, you know, is sickly or whatever. But that's pretty much what happens. So she ends up moving to this town or going back to her, her hometown or whatever and is working and stuff. Um but where the downward spiral begins is that this the family is steadily asking for more money because of oh you know this happened or that happened or whatever um oh your daughter got sick and stuff whatever and so back to the horrors and the downside of people in this and in the world is that somebody found out um being nosy as people are that she has a daughter that nobody knows about or whatever because hey it's none of y'all's big business but she had a daughter people at the, her job found out they reported it to the higher up she ended up getting fired from her job because she was being uh um, dishonest and stuff and thus she you know is now kind of now she doesn't have now she's not able to work like she was to make the money to support her daughter and to save up and stuff whatever and so she ends up basically living on the streets and just you know more or less turning to prostitution and stuff like that to just try to like she like cut off her hair to sell to this wig shop whatever she like sold some of her teeth everything she could for what she thought was going towards helping her daughter meanwhile these people are just the family that took her daughter in or whatever treating her like the ugly stepchild and, you know, like Cinderella or whatever. Um, and so all this stuff is kind of starts to slowly tie back in because we find out that also in this town, and th this is a little bit before some of the stuff I mentioned with Fantine or whatever, but our boy Jean is by, by the end of this volume, he is a mayor of this town. But, but before then he became a very wealthy businessman because he ended up just passing by. There was a burning building. Two kids stuck. Everybody's freaking out. Jean went into the flames, pulled these kids out. and was like, hey, here's your kids or whatever. And so the person whose kids he saved or whatever was like, I think it was like a high ranking person, somebody, somebody important in town. And then, but when Jean went into the fire, his like papers from the prison or whatever, his identity papers sort of got burnt up in the flames because when the guy was like, hey, who are you or whatever? Where's your papers or whatever? Let me see them so I can you know, properly thank you, whatever. And then he pulls out the papers and they just turn to ash. And John's like, uh, and the guy was like, hey, I don't care who you are. You know, thank you for saving my children or whatever. And so basically John is ended up using some of the money from the prison or whatever to start a small business and the business ended up booming and becoming a a uh, economic stable for this town because of all the business and stuff it brought in. But he also, like the bishop that helped him all the all, all that time back, he also lived a very simple and modest life. He gave away majority of his wealth to help build hospitals, build schools for children with which. Building schools for small, for younger children was unheard of in this time um, and stuff, whatever. And so, yeah. And so eventually, you know, the people of the town eventually talked him into taking the role of mayor because they're like, hey, think of, you know, think of all the good you're already doing. Think about what, if you could actually become the mayor of, you know, how much more good you'll be able to do and stuff, whatever. And so, Yeah. And so that's kind of how like some of the crossing paths are starting to intertwine with some of this stuff is Jean taking the uh, 
the disciplines and the morals and just the kindness that he learned from the bishop that that opened his door for him when nobody else in the world would. And so he is trying to do the same. But meanwhile, you know, lurking in the background of, of this story is also a police officer that he dealt with back when he was in the prison is now working in the town that he's now the mayor of. And then you also had this guy who was also working to try to bring down John because, of course, people being nosy, wanting to know too much or whatever. And this guy literally trying to sabotage John and everything because they're like, man, this guy just blew into town one day and all of a sudden, you know, started a business and it blew up and now he's the mayor and stuff, whatever. Meanwhile, I try to I try to start a business and it failed and now I'm living on the streets and I'm barely making by. People won't even look at me or whatever. And then this guy ended up in a situation where he ended up getting trapped under his carts or whatever. And all these people in town couldn't lift it up or whatever. And so the police officer guy ended up being there. And he's kind of on to because he's been kind of like following John for a while or whatever. And so long story short, John ended up saving this guy and then put him up in the hospital that he helped build and fund. And they ended up offering the guy a job or he left a message like, hey, the mayor said, you know, once you are healed or whatever, he has a job waiting for you, yada, yada, yada. And that made this guy feel horrible because he's like, man, I spent all this time trying to tear down this person. Meanwhile, this guy was selfless and, you know, showing kindness and stuff to me. But, uh, but yeah, but all in all, you know, like I said, this has been a, such a fantastic and such a special read. And like I said, it is just so awesome. just showing both, you know, the, the darkness and the potential light that, that exists in all of us, um, within humanity and stuff. And the art of this manga is just so fantastic. Like you can just see so much of the emotion of these characters and stuff just packed so deeply into the into these uh into these uh images and stuff. Cause even Fantine and her uh, daughter uh, Cosette and stuff, whatever you just see, just like so much. So much care and attention that, uh, and I forgot to mention, uh, the story and art of this adaptation is done by Takahiro Arai. You can see just so much care and attention that this uh, manga author did or had in this um, adaptation of this uh, this legendary story. Um, and another thing I forgot to mention earlier too, whatever, is that, <laughs> and of course, you know, just learning through the history of all this stuff, whatever, uh, the Victor Hugo, the Victor Hugo person that did the story or whatever, one of his other most well-known works is The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which he wrote 30 years before he wrote this. <laughs> so that, and that's kind of crazy because we know how many adaptations that that has had over the years, including the, the Disney, uh, movie, animated movie that we all probably saw back in the nineties or whatever. I know I did growing up, but, um, but yeah, Les Miserables, um, like I said, it is just such a fantastic read. Um, the next volume is right around the corner, so I would definitely be picking that up. But, um, but I highly encourage anybody that might have maybe heard of this story or whatever, but maybe haven't read the novel of it. If you're into manga like I am and into great, powerful stories, then I think this might be one that y'all might want to put on your radar and to add to your collection because I will definitely be having this sit next to, um, I'm probably going to clear out some of the stuff on this top shelf because I'm probably going to put this right next to uh, my 20th Century Boys and Venom Saga up here on top. But, um, but yeah, fantastic read, highly recommended. And, uh, and just know that try to be kind to each other out there in the world. Um, cause like I said, we all do not know what the person next to us is going through. Um, and just because somebody is happy and smiling might not mean that they have the best life in the world or Hey, just because somebody is looking like, you know, might not be well dressed or whatever. They might be the wealthiest and happiest person in the world, but we just don't know. So just try to be kind to each other out there. Um, 
because me reading this was just like I said, it just kind of reminded me of some of some life situations that I've gone through even just recently we were some stuff but um and just some kindness and stuff that some people have shown towards me to kind of help me um get out of my hole that I was in to kind of help me and my family move on to the next step or whatever and so it's like that's what I try to do my best to try to pay that kindness forward where I can and I hope that those of y'all out there listening or watching um will do the same as well you know like I said even even just the small stuff you know um you know hey somebody needs a couple bucks hey if you got it give it to them whatever um somebody needs help with something somebody needs advice uh do do your best you know to try to um help one another or one another um even if it's just listening because sometimes that might be all a person needs somebody they might not need money or food or whatever sometimes they might just need an ear just somebody to just take the time to listen to them and stuff so um because that might be the thing that kind of helps to bring that person out of the darkness or out of the rough spot that they are in or to kind of just help them vent because sometimes all, all a person might need is just to vent to get whatever burdens are on their mind heart or shoulders is to just talk with somebody and uh yeah <laughs> i feel like i'm starting to ramble but this was just uh just a, such a such a awesome read like i said i cannot wait to get to read more of this story and to see where more things go with these characters um and just know i did not tell every little detail of the story just some of the some of the kind of high level highlights and stuff but um but it's still something i still recommend you read and check out for yourself but with that being said i'm gonna wrap this up as always thank you so much for watching and or listening um you can find me everywhere at danny's a talk and make sure you're subscribed to the video version of, the, of everything i do on youtube or following the audio version on all podcast services and as i always say treat yourself to something nice read some manga Watch some anime and TV, play some video games, and live your best life. And with that, I'm out. Y'all have an awesome day. Peace.